And up next is Dr. John Gore, and he is sitting in the back. He's mic'd up already. So, so come on up, Dr. Gore. And if I could get... Slide deck number zero two. That would be great. Now, I've known Dr. John Gore for many years. And there's one thing I can tell you about Dr. Big. Gore. It has always been all about the patient. <laughs> always patients are first with you. Always. Dr. John Gore is a urologist. He's here at the Fred Hutch and the University of Washington. He was instrumental in starting our patient survey network and really helping us to stay focused on the patient experience and the impact of treatment on patients. And I had notes that I was going to go through the whole spiel. Is there I anything else? I, I, I thought you could. Yeah, I was going to because everyone's talking about their experience with the summit, uh, and I want to as well. I also, I always have to go to the think tank and listen to Doug brag about me, so I'm going to brag about Doug a little bit. Uh, and I, I just want to talk about my own relationship with Beacon, so I got it. Okay. This is good. I'm going to go sit down. All right. Well, um, it's really nice to see everyone. Um, I looked back, and I think this is my sixth summit, um, and so I'm a longtime summit attendee. My relationship with Beacon goes back to 2010. Uh, like many of us who have had a chance to speak, it was a touch point with Diane. Um, I met with Diane at the AUA, uh, and she talked about her vision for Beacon. She didn't do her usual spiel uh, this morning where she talks about how you say the organization's name. Uh, Beacon is a very natural thing to say, but it's wrong. It's very, very wrong. It's Beacon, as in be a beacon of light. Um, but um, we met and we had a chance to talk about policy related issues in bladder cancer at one of the think tanks um, and for me uh, I was hooked um, and I had the opportunity to lead a working group within Beacon that was focused on patient-centered outcomes uh, and that's where I had this momentous meeting with Angela Smith, Angie Smith um, and that bore out uh, I think a, a now 10 years, actually more, 12 years relationship that's focused on applying patient-centered outcomes research methods to bladder cancer. Um, I have several disclosures uh, related to Beacon, which is just that I, I love this organization. Um, I love the people that I get to work with. Stephanie uh, and I have been co-funded as researchers since 2014, continuously. Um, I've worked with Andrea since she became the CEO, um, and I love every opportunity I can to see the Beacon staff um, and Diane, and so I'm a huge fan of this organization, and it's why I keep coming to the summit. I mean, I'm going to plug myself. I've never been to the city of Philadelphia. There are direct flights. If you need me for my seventh summit, I'm happy to attend. Um, so um, uh, I'm going to talk about patient engagement and research. Um, you know, this is also a really cool opportunity for me to see a lot of familiar faces um, in the crowd, um, and fortunately a lot of new faces, so welcome uh, to the summit. Um, this is a, a story of how we tried to learn from the experience that those with bladder cancer go through, how we can make our research efforts better, more relevant, more applicable to the person who is navigating some of the complex decision making that we have to go through. And um, we get to work with incredibly talented patients like, like Doug, Doug McLean, who's been on our advisory boards, who's been on our uh, webinars, who's been on our uh, patient education videos, um, and always does a fantastic and wonderful job. And so I would invite all of you who are interested to reach out, and we have some QR codes at the end. Um, so we're going to talk about a number of things. Um, Stephanie alluded to with Carlos, patient advocacy and research. Um, that's really important. You know, research funding for bladder cancer was so abysmal 10 years ago that when Angie and I got funded for this trial, Cisto, that I'm going to tell you a little bit more about, at the time we looked and it looked like it was the largest individual funding for bladder cancer other than a cooperative group trial in bladder cancer's history from the federal government. Um, and it's a big study, but that still was sort of a a measuring stick of sort of the abysmal history of federal funding for bladder cancer research. 
I want to talk about patient advocates and how they relate to research through Beacon, and then obviously how, and, and just as kind of naturally why you might want to get involved in some of the efforts that we have ongoing. You know, um, research sits in the sort of confluence of a lot of really important things, whether it's fundraising. You know, sometimes we need to fund things that, that fall in the cracks between what maybe the federal government or other organizations might fund. Support, political, research kind of sits at the, at the nexus of a lot of these issues. Um, and I think when we think about patient-centered outcomes research, what we're trying to talk about are identifying questions that are important to patients. One uh, stakeholder that we try to think about a lot, and I'm happy to share with you um, a funny story about this, but that we try to think about a lot are, are caregivers. Um, when we founded the Patient Survey Network, about 25% of our participants in the PSN are caregivers of loved ones or friends with bladder cancer. Um, why is this important? Well, we want to figure out what outcomes are important to patients who navigate this diagnosis on a daily basis. So identifying outcomes that matter. Understanding the benefits and harms of the treatments that we deliver so we can make better decisions when we're in our clinician's office. How we understand that you know, patients come with their own individual characteristics. And so treatment for patient A might not be the right treatment for patient B. So how the diversity of the patient in front of you makes a difference. And then I think all too often, these ideas for research studies that we think matter come from someone like me who just thinks, gosh, I have a good idea, this is what's important. But how can we gather up perspectives from all the individuals whose opinion or, or experience matters in terms of that decision and that comparison? So these are sort of the key questions underlying patient-centered outcomes research. And, and this idea of PCOR, patient-centered outcomes research, is, is not old. It's actually relatively new. The phraseology comes from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which was born out of the ACA, um, PCORI. And these were their kind of key overriding questions. So given what is unique about me, my personal characteristics, my health conditions, what can I expect will happen to me? Um, as I navigate what, will, what I can expect, what are the options that are available to me and how can I weigh the benefits and the harms of those options? Is there anything that I can do that is in my power? You know, at this summit we're going to talk about nutrition, survivorship. What can I do to make the outcomes that matter to me better? And what about the system around me? You know, how can the healthcare system sort of prop me up and help me have a better outcome? And so these are the questions that we, we try to answer. And the way that we try to answer them is through what's called comparative effectiveness research. Essentially weighing treatment A versus treatment B. And with PCORI, we're not trying to examine new therapeutics. This is not really designed to test a new drug. There are other avenues for that. We're trying to look at existing interventions where all too often it's based on my experience as a clinician or the resources I have in my own backyard and the evidence for what I'm doing is not super robust. So can we make comparisons about existing interventions to figure out what works best for which patient and how can we best balance benefits and harms? So um, what is patient engagement and research? And this is kind of where we come back to story time. So um, I met Dr. Smith at the Beacon Think Tank in Aspen, Colorado in 2012. She was eight months pregnant. Um, and we were part of this working group where what I had observed is that the Beacon Inspire platform is this massively engaged online forum where individuals share their personal experiences, but also take a lot of time to share those experiences with people newly navigating a cancer journey. And it just seemed like a wealth of expertise. It wasn't my expertise, you know, it was the expertise of people that have experiences that I can't speak to because I don't have this diagnosis. And it just felt like this was a missed opportunity to engage that expertise in how we can do a better job caring for bladder cancer patients. And right around that time, PCORI came out. And PCORI had a mechanism called an engagement award. And this was designed to create new relationships between researchers and organizations to promote research. Well, there's one bladder cancer organization that we were already part of, Beacon, 
And when we approached Beacon about the engagement award, the answer was an overwhelming yes. And so we started working with Stephanie on how we can understand how to incorporate patient engagement into research. This was not something where we could pull like a, a textbook off of a shelf and that textbook explained how to do patient-centered outcomes research. So what I, I'm gonna show you, some of it we kind of made up ourselves as we tried to navigate what we felt like were best practices for engagement in research. But we think about these different phases of a research study. There's the preparatory phase, and I'll explain what I mean. There's the execution phase, that's where you're actually doing the study. And there's the translational phase. So what are these different phases? So the preparatory phase, we're trying to understand what's important. You know, I, I have these experiences in clinic where I can perceive gaps in the care that we provide, and that might be a really good research question. But I think the wealth of experience that everyone in this room has might generate some really unique questions that I can't answer because I don't have that experience. And then how can we prioritize those research questions so we're answering those that are sort of the most important? As we go through a study and we think about how to design it, how to recruit patients for that study, what data should we collect and how can we prioritize that data so we're collecting the most important things first? And then even as we analyze the results, you know, how can we engage patients to make sure that that process is robust? And I'm gonna show you how we've done it, but also how we as a, a sort of research community have failed in the past and, and how that harms not only patients, but also sort of the science of the care that we try to deliver. And then lastly, you know, we have these traditional mechanisms for how we get the word out. You know, I, I did a study and I think it was really cool and so I write a paper about it and I just expect the world to read that paper and act on the results, but that's not how it works. So how can we get the word out through patient-directed channels, through the media, through, you know, scientifically what we would consider to be less traditional mechanisms, but are the ways that we need to think about how to get the word out so that the results that we generate can actually be implemented in practice. Um, so this is sort of a silly thing to say out loud, but 12 years ago to say kind of what if we put the patient at the center of these research trial-based comparative effectiveness research activities was really a unique thing to do. You know, research, I think to its own detriment, has always been something we've done to patients. And it's very obvious to us, but it, it seems a little ridiculous that research never was something that was done with patients. And so I think what we want to talk about is how we've done it and how um, this might be an influence for those of you who want to get engaged in some of the research activities through Beacon. Um, and so um, uh, uh, the way that we started was with this PSN, this patient survey network through Beacon. Um, and what I love about this symbol that you can see on the, on the start curve is this was actually created by a patient based on the Beacon symbol. And so I love the sort of magnifying glass with the question in it. But you know, we, we, we started our engagement process even with our logo design. Um, and so uh, job number one, was to recruit patients. So how can we reach patients so that we can learn from them and learn from their opinions? And this is where having a partner like Beacon just makes this easy. We can recruit through the website. We can do YouTube videos. We can recruit through webinars. We can recruit through materials that we can deliver in the clinic, paper materials, electronic materials. And there were these multimodal ways that we approach sort of the patient community to try to gather up their voices. Uh, and it worked. We were able to get input from you know, hundreds of patients to tell us what was important to them. Step two, we needed to start with some questions. So it's very hard to just ask someone what questions are important to you. It makes it a much easier process if we start with essentially like some seed questions. And so we did that process and then we had essentially like a, 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 a higher level meeting at a think tank where we went through these questions and we narrowed them down to some refined questions. I think this was in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And that process actually was really illuminating for us because what came out of that process were several prioritized questions even before we went to the PSN that weren't contributed by researchers that were part of this process, but were contributed by patients that were part of this process. And some of these questions have influenced some processes that we've gone through to try to get additional funding for research. Um, and then we sent out a survey 
to this newly constructed Beacon Patient Survey Network, and we asked patients to rank these questions, and in addition, despite the seed process we went through, to contribute their own questions. What are the things that the Patient Survey Network cares about that maybe our smaller group of advocate advisors didn't yet have an opportunity to think about? And so these are the results. We did two rounds of surveys. It's really kind of mind-boggling that the Patient Survey Network is now almost 10 years old. But you can see that we were able to generate uh, input from 1,000 participants. It always seems fake when it's such like a beautifully round number, but we actually had exactly 1,000 participants in the round two survey. Most of our patients, kind of like the epidemiology of bladder cancer, had non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, but we got a lot of input from patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer and even those with metastatic bladder cancer. And these are just the questions, and, and this is not meant for you to go over these individual questions, but I wanna highlight a couple things. Number one, if you look at questions one and two, in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, how do we make better decisions about who should actually think about having their bladder removed, and what do we do when BCG doesn't work? These questions are from 2015, 2016, but they're just as relevant in bladder cancer care today. And what I like about these questions are these are the same questions I have. You know, I'm a, a, a clinical expert. I probably shouldn't use quotes, but I'm supposed to be a clinical expert in bladder cancer. These are the questions that I have. And so this shows the confluence of what's important to patients is also important to us as clinicians. But there are a couple questions on here that were de novo from free text responses exclusively from patients that rose up to be prioritized research questions, such as what can we do when people are in our office to decrease the pain and discomfort from the procedures that we do for bladder cancer, whether it's bladder installations, cystoscopies. This bore out a huge amount of effort from Dr. Smith in particular to try to create funding for comparative effectiveness research in cystoscopy discomfort. Unfortunately, we haven't had any of those studies funded, but it just shows kind of the priority on what's important to patients. And that question purely came out of patients. It wasn't contributed by any of our clinician experts. And similarly, how we can increase quit rates among those who are active smokers at diagnosis. It's a really important problem, but you might wonder why that wasn't a priority for clinicians some of that may be comfort level. You know, a lot of us are subspecialists, we're not primary care doctors, and so our expertise in smoking cessation may be lower, but based on a prioritized question like this, maybe that should be the target. How can we educate more of our, our brethren in urology, medical oncology, radiation oncology to be smoking cessation providers? And then these are the questions for muscle invasive bladder cancer, and I'm gonna skip over this a little bit. I'm happy to go back to this if anyone wants to see these individual questions, or I can send you the prioritized list. But similarly for metastatic bladder cancer, you know, we, um, uh, we found patient-derived questions to be prioritized irrespective of disease stage. So for example, if you look at the number four question, you know, we always think about how to care for patients with metastatic disease, but it's also a burden on the caregiver. And there's sort of this dictum of who cares for the carer. It's a really challenging problem. And so, you know, how can we do um, uh, uh, supportive care for caregivers? And that was a question that came out uniquely from patient responses. So then, as we took these questions in, we distributed them to funders. So how can we make bladder cancer a priority for the National Cancer Institute, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and PCORI? Um, we talked about how bladder cancer is un underfunded, so can we deliver to these funders what's important to bladder cancer patients so they can make that a new priority? My um, mentor uh, at UCLA, I, I came to UW from UCLA. My mentor at uh, UCLA, his partner is an enter entertainment lawyer, uh, and he talks about how if you're a lower level celebrity, you have to make a lot of outgoing calls. You know, you have to get the casting agent to want to look at you for the role. If you're Leo, you know, if you're Matt Damon, you get the incoming call. Very rarely in research do we get the incoming call, but here came P. Corey with the incoming call where they made our research questions a priority topic for their pragmatic clinical trial mechanism. And they always say the best grants to apply for are ones that are written for you. And so this led us to increase our engagement efforts toward actually doing some of the research that our PSN said was important. 
So we kind of initially thought, gosh, what a great outcome. PCORI made this a priority topic. What a successful project. And then Erica Wolf, who's in the corner, met with me and said, well, no, you need to apply for this. This is for you. You need to do this work. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> um, and so this just shows sort of our iterative process built over several years to increase engagement from not just generating research questions, but participating in the research process. So the PSN led to another engagement award from PCORI called PEER, which was promoting engagement in research, which led to the patient research advocate program that used to overlap with the summit quite a bit, you know, seven, eight years ago. And then PIPE, which has this aspirational goal to make connections between patient research advocates and funders or um, you know, companies doing clinical trials or investigators doing investigator-initiated research. Um, and so um, you know, this uh, led to this process where we had the think tank. The think tank led to this peer curriculum, which led to the leadership summit. And out of that were born these working group calls to try to create teams that could answer these questions. And that led to CISTO. So CISTO is um, not just uh, the best acronym for a study that I've ever been a part of. So the CISTO team is at that table. And so all around that table um, are uh, Erica Wolf, Sungmin Kim, uh, uh, Grace Mariel and Casey, and Kristen Fulmer. And they basically are the executors of a massive multi-center study, but it also uh, is uh, directly responding to a research question that's important to patients. How can we make better decisions for who should have their bladder removed for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, and what should we do after BCG fails? This is a schema that you see for a lot of clinical trials, but this is a very different study, and I want to explain why and how patient engagement led to some of the unique aspects of this study schema. The first one is this. So CISTO is not a randomized trial. So when patients come to us with recurrent non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and we enroll them in CISTO, there's no kind of flip of a coin to say you should or should not have your bladder removed. And the big reason why is patients told us through the patient survey network that they wouldn't sign up for a study like that. That, that about 10% of patients would actually allow themselves to be randomized, and that makes a lot of sense. You know, having your bladder removed is a, a surgery that begets a lot of personal preference. And so if you, you know, ask someone, would you want to have treatment that allowed you to spare your bladder versus a bladder removal surgery, the number of patients that would actually submit to that flip of a coin is a really small number. And just the fact that we asked uh, is unique. Uh, and we got people's opinions about this question. And you can see that a lot of these opinions echoed that. You know, the, the idea of a, a clinical trial would be really valuable, but a randomization scheme would be really challenging. The other questions that we asked were, what questions are important as we navigate this decision? Oh, I can't go back. And what is also unique about CISTO are the outcomes that we measure. So there are outcomes that we all agree are important in bladder cancer. Did the cancer come back? Did the cancer get worse? But there are also some unique outcomes that we measure that are atypical for a clinical trial. What was the financial burden of this series of treatments on you and your care? That came out of direct patient engagement. But I think most importantly is this idea of an observational trial, because that's very unique in cancer care. You know, most of the evidence we generate is from these sort of flip of a coin trials. However, our literature has, I, I would say, too numerous, numerous examples of studies that truly failed. You know, somebody put a lot of money into these studies to try to generate new evidence, and that study didn't work because they didn't do the simple act of asking patients, would you sign up for this trial? And I always wanted to use uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley's Ozymandias in some exemplary way for a, a slide, and so I finally found a good excuse for it. But you know, the, the clinical trial, the randomized clinical trial is sort of the, the mecca, and a lot of people will kind of tell you that you know, there is no evidence other than randomized controlled trial evidence. But there's gotta be a way to learn something to help patients outside of the bounds of an RCT, especially for clinical questions where an RCT just won't work. 
So um, as we go back to thinking about sort of the preparatory phase, the execution phase, and the translational phase, well, after we got Cisto funded, now we actually have to do the work. And this is where patient engagement can augment our efforts in a number of ways. It helps us think about how we design the surveys that we're gonna administer, and how we, and, and this sounds very simple, but how we order the surveys, so that as patients are going through this and they're completing this clinical trial, we're getting the most important information from them up front, and we're not kind of over-fatiguing them with the burden of the surveys that, that we wanna ask. So our patient research advocates helped us design the surveys that we would administer. They helped us create recruitment materials. So this is a member of our external advisory board, Dr. Seema Porton, but there are a number of patients that are on this recruitment video as well. They also kind of became a core part of the organizational structure of the study. So you can see that they have their own box, the advocate advisory board, right next to an external advisory board comprised of bladder cancer experts, other bladder cancer stakeholders like industry sponsors and payers. And then they also can help us create materials that are targeting patients navigating some of the complex issues in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, learning more about what it means to have a transurethral resection of the biopsy, what it means to navigate you know, um, uh, uh, a recurrence of your bladder cancer. These are things that were written by experts, reviewed by our patients, and now are used on a day-to-day -day basis in patient instructions that are delivered through things like Epic or MyChart, where you can access these materials either independently or through your doctor. So these are a couple of the additional materials. Um, so I wanna kinda highlight how uh, patient and stakeholder influence really directly has reviewed different aspects of our program and some of the programs at large. So CISTO is our large study that was funded and actually recently, and this is something to celebrate, recently completed accrual. So we enrolled 572 patients across 36 sites across the US. Um, I was hoping to roll up in this summit uh, with an announcement of our notice of award, uh, but we did get, um, we did get a really, 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 really good score for an NCI grant that would allow us to continue to follow up all of the CISTO patients for another five years. So we're expecting to get that notice of award within the next month. I was hoping it would happen before March 8th, but our expectation is that we'll continue to do the work of CISTO for at least another five years. CISTO has an endpoint of 12 month quality of life. But we all know that the lifespan of the bladder cancer patient, it's not, it's not like other cancers where there's an episode of care and you're done. It's often something where two-year outcomes, five-year outcomes are really critical and really important to decision making. And so um, we hopefully will be able to announce to the world our, our funding for what we call best care, which is an extension of CISTO really soon. Um, we actually went through a number of research efforts to try to address cystoscopy discomfort. Even though these didn't get funded, they actually really strongly influenced a lot of us who provide a large portion of, of bladder cancer care as part of our practices. So I, I do wanna give one example of that. We were um, trying to create um, uh, what we needed to do to write a grant around cystoscopy discomfort. So we did a systematic review to look at what's known about reducing discomfort related to a lot of these interventions. And we found a couple things. So we found, for example, that when you give a little squeeze of the fluid bag that's used for the irrigation during a cystoscopy, that actually in a randomized controlled trial was shown to reduce the discomfort of a cystoscopy. That now is a standard part of our cystoscopies at the University of Washington, but it wasn't you know, five, six years ago. So even though we didn't get the grant funded, it still influenced us to provide more patient-centered care in the clinic. Um, we also have a grant in called CROCUS. So CISTO is us trying to do a better job of guiding people with recurrent non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. There are very challenging decisions that, that patients have to make with muscle invasive bladder cancer, and the evidence is very light comparing chemo radiation and radical cystectomy in that clinical space. So can we learn more in that patient population to help people make better decisions? Um, and that grant is currently in review at, at PCORI. But there's also this other side. 
you know, how can patients review grants and help funders make better decisions about which grants do or do not have relevance to the everyday patient experience. And that's true for funders like the DOD, but also through for, for industry sponsors. You know, more and more, you're gonna see an industry-sponsored clinical trial that has patient-reported outcomes as part of what they're actually collecting and measuring. And that's really great, but that's strongly influenced by the patient advocates that have been part of that protocol design process. Um, and then lastly, you know, um, uh, when I started this process with Beacon and when I started this process with uh, Stephanie, I, I was uh, a lot younger. Um, I made the joke uh, at the table that the picture they have of me is actually an accurate picture. But I used to come to this summit and they still had my like 2009, you know, first start at UW picture. And man, like that guy was so young and so charismatic, but, <laughs> but now I'm old. And that oldness has allowed myself and Angie, who actually looks the same, but has allowed myself and Angie to have some influence on other folks. So we've been able to share some of what we're doing with those that are doing work in other cancers, like prostate cancer or kidney cancer, but other disease states. So one of my mentees is a gender-affirming surgeon caring for transgender and non-binary patients, and she just got a large PCORI pragmatic trial funded to address social support for that patient population, especially as they navigate surgical decision making. So, you know, even as we celebrate Cisto kind of uh, going on to its next phase, we've been able to have some influence outside of Beacon uh, in sort of helping researchers make better patient-centered decisions uh, in the research that they do. So these are just a couple of, I think, key quotes um, from our patient advocates that just highlight the value that I think they have taken from the process. I can tell you, you know, in my own perspective, the value that I've gotten as a researcher. So when I was a fellow, I was a fellow in a program called the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. And if you had asked sort of 32-year-old me what kind of research would I be doing, um, I thought I would be sort of a quantitative quality of care researcher. So I thought I was gonna be going to hospitals and trying to figure out how we could make quality better from a provider orientation. And this was sort of an offshoot of that program. Uh, and now I'm a, a card-carrying patient-centered outcomes researcher, and I do a lot of work trying to figure out how to design and implement patient-centered resources for cancer care, and my life is better for it. But I, I also think, oh, I also think that um, this process, I hope, and, and some of our advocates in the room can attest to this, has also been a really valuable um, experience for our patient research advocates. Um, so I, I think people always wanna know how they can get involved. Um, this is a very QR code heavy uh, summit, <laughs> but I have some QR codes uh, to show you. Um, we still have the learning module system for the patient research advocate program. It's intended to help patients feel comfortable being a part of a research team. I think we create a very welcoming environment for our advocacy advisory board, and I think we try to make sure that all the opinions on that AAB are, are welcome, encouraged, and engaged, but it can be really intimidating um, to be on the other side and to kind of take that first step into contributing to a research team so we can help you learn about how to get sort of capacity built so that you feel stronger um, in that role. But there are a number of ways that you can get connected to research, whether it's reviewing for grants, working with industry. I will tell you, a lot of our patient research advocates tick several of these boxes. You know, they're part of our advocacy advisory board. They worked with Merck on an industry-sponsored trial. They review for the DOD or for Beacon. And so a lot of our patient research advocates tick multiple of these boxes. And then you can always join the patient survey network. You know, um, Angie and I were talking the other day about the fact that all that work we did is, is almost a decade old. Some of the questions, we, we hope, we hope the questions change, right? Because we hope that in you know, eight to 10 years, we've answered some of those questions. So we probably need to repeat that research prioritiz uh, prioritization exercise. But the other thing that the PSN has done over the years is it's done a lot of individual research projects. So you may have seen these through the Inspire platform where we've asked for your opinion about research study design or even a discrete research question or about quality of life, or about financial toxicity. So you can always join the patient survey network to give us your, your voice and your input. And so engaging in clinical trials, 
That's one QR code, and these all link to different kind of beacon-related things. The PSN is housed at UNC, but it's the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network PSN. And then there's a, a different website on engaging with pharmaceutical companies on research, which is a really important role to have. I just want to pause there for a second just to give you a chance if you wanted to look at any of those. I can, I, you guys have these slides too, so we can share these pretty broadly. Yeah, and the last thing I just want to say is, you know, um, I get the opportunity to kind of stand up here and be essentially like a representative. Um, and I am, uh, I am sort of the, the great Gatsby standing up here representing a gigantic team. Uh, it's a gigantic team of patients and patient advocates, other stakeholders in bladder cancer, and then our fantastic Cisto team that's in the back. So if there are questions that I can't answer, you know, we're all available here today uh, for any questions that you might have. I'll show, oh, okay, that's better. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gore, for the presentation. I think it's so important to, to hear the voice of the patient or the voice of the other side, I would say. And we are new to the bladder cancer community, I would say, uh, since uh, late October 2023. I have a question for you. I think it's a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much for that. Um, in a completely different world, parallel world, I have a TBI, a, trained brain, uh, a traumatic brain injury, and I did many research as a patient. And recently, uh, it started in 2022, but it, we're doing it since 2023. One of the research team in UW asked me to be one of the PI, the principal investigator. And my question to you, you know, it's quite amazing what you show, how you can get the patient to be there, but why not to have the patient part of being you know, the researcher, the principal investigator. Yeah, so I think that is something that we, we have engaged in. You know, the, the best example I can show you is our, our largest funded study, which is CISTO. But the cystoscopy discomfort trial that um, I'm happy to talk more about, but that didn't get funded, did include a patient as an investigator on the research team, not just as an advocate advisory board member. And that, that study was really cool because it came out of the peer program which created the patient's research advocate program. That question was selected by our group of patients and they really went through the process together with our team of researchers to design that study. And so we, we definitely have adopted that model. I think that's a really important model. Thank you. Sir? Okay, thank you. Uh, the BCAN material is great. It fits in with what you're saying about having this understandable to patients and caregivers, not in medical ease. Um, I noticed your studies, I think you said were around 2015 and 18. So I'm wondering what you could say. Since then, of course, we have the BCG shortage. And there's a lot of confusion and uncertainty in the patient and caregiver community about how that affects care, and particularly half doses. Yeah. Five treatments versus six treatments, two maintenance versus three. If I go to this place, great medical centers, I can get this, but another medical center is different. And so I think the, the shortage has really exacerbated this confusion, and I'm wondering if you've talked to patients about that, and if um, not, what might be in the horizon? Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great point. I think that's something that also shows sort of the confluence of what is a challenge for us is also a challenge for you. What is a challenge for you is also a challenge for us. So um, I can talk a little bit about clinically, and then I can also talk about how that influences some of our research practice. So clinically, it's really hard. 
One thing for me as the PI of Cisto is I interface with these 36 sites across the US, so I get to hear about the challenges that people are confronting. And I have my own bias as someone who works at a large university-based comprehensive cancer center academic facility. You know, for me, my investigational pharmacy, my oncology pharmacy, they're in the same building. So if I want to offer something that is sort of the new standard, that's very easy for me to do. But one of our sites is an independent urology practice in Nashville, and that's a lot harder for them to do because there are hazardous waste issues. And, and so sometimes what we consider to be standard of care just can't be provided you know, in certain community sites. And so then when you take away BCG, you make it really hard for those sites. And the other reality is that um, you know, it's very easy for someone you know, standing up here like me to say, well, just come to Seattle and get that done. That's not so easy to do. You know, uh, I don't know how many of you are from Washington, but there's a gigantic mountain range you know, right next to us too that's not always passable. So it's very easy and, and flippant for us to say that, but how can we promote people getting what we would consider to be high level, you know, high quality care close to home? You know, I don't have any easy answers. There is some evidence from Europe that showed that lower doses of BCG work just as well as higher doses of BCG. So we all felt very comfortable doing split doses. Um, but um, that is sort of something that we're all evolving with. From a research standpoint, it influenced us. And we actually went to P. Corey, our funder, to say, hey, why don't we just get rid of this whole requirement that the patients got BCG? Because with the shortages, patients were getting recurrent cancer, but they never got BCG in the first place because they got chemotherapy or some other treatment. And so we wanted to be able to learn from those patients as well. And unfortunately, you know, that request was, was rejected. But it does, it does influence how we think about research because as we navigate these periodic shortages, you know, how can we guide clinicians in particular who are struggling with what to do to make better decisions? Can we actually generate some contemporary evidence for that? We're trying. Any other questions? Well, I'm sticking around, so um, if you have any questions that come up, please don't hesitate to reach out, and thank you very much for your attention.